Blackstar Network is here. Hold no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The human rights campaign says he was fired for cause, but the former president of the organization, Alfonso Davis, says it was discrimination. He's here to tell his side of the story. The Supreme Court's ruling about Alabama's uh, congressional district sends a strong message about protecting voting rights or actually advancing GOP voter suppression. A surveillance camera was found at the remote Pennsylvania hunting camp where Jamaican immigrant Peter Spencer was killed. We'll get the latest on the investigation from his mother and the president and chair of the Allegheny County Democratic Black Caucus. Congressional Black Caucus uh, Chairwoman Joyce Bates is demanding an apology after Republican Congressman Hal Rogers told her to kiss his ass over wearing a face mask. 
and two white men get arrested and are now free on bond after chasing and shooting at a black FedEx driver who was just trying to do his job. Folks, she schools folks on the basketball court. In tonight's Marketplace segment, you'll meet Chicago artists whose uh, painting skills are just as smooth as her crossover fadeaway jump shot. Oh, Y'all, it's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, the first black president of the Human Rights Campaign, uh, the largest gay rights advocacy group in the country, uh, is suing the Organization for Racial Discrimination and Unequal Pay. Uh, Alfonso David says he was terminated in September because of his race. HRC says he was fired for cause and his involvement in the case of former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. He joins us right now. I'm glad to have you uh, on the show. So... Uh, let's let's walk through this. Um, they say you were fired because you were involved in depositions show your involvement in aiding um, Andrew Cuomo, then governor of New York, that that your actions in that case violated your contract. Um, what say you? Well, first, Roland, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for what you do. Um, I think we need to start from the beginning. Because just for, in case folks don't know this, I worked in state government for 12 years. I worked as the governor's counsel for four of those years. And after I left state government, uh, after working on marriage equality, working on criminal justice reforms, working on the MWBE uh, policy, after I left state government a year and a half later, I received a phone call from the state asking for my files. They wanted to know where my files were. I told them my files should be in my office. They then asked me whether or not I had a copy of a memo, which I did because I saved all of my That is something that all lawyers do. And in some states, you're required to do that. And I provided them a copy of the memo that I had in my possession, which I was required to do by law. Um, after that, the attorney general conducted an investigation into allegations against the governor that Women had claimed that he was he had engaged in harassment, sexual harassment, to be specific. And during their investigation, they asked to speak to me and told me that I was legally prohibited from speaking to anyone about the investigation or the fact that they were interviewing me as a result of their investigation. I was not the subject of their investigation. They were talking to me and a number of other people. The attorney general then issues a report of their investigation. And in their report, they indicate that they spoke to me. Um, the report wasn't about me. The report was about the governor. I then told HRC that they should do an independent probe because they were asking questions about my engagement. I said, do an imp independent review, and this will clarify the facts for everyone, which they agreed to do. And they also said they would be transparent in their findings. Fast forward. Three and a half weeks later, the organization then asked me to resign without telling me the findings of their investigation. They didn't disclose a report, even though they said they would be transparent in their findings. And now they're saying they're firing me because I was interviewed by the attorney general, because I worked for the governor, because I provided a report that I was, or a memo that I was legally obligated to provide. This is nothing more than basic race discrimination. And I'm not pulling a straws here. This is an organization that has already been accused of systemic racial bias. In 2015, 
there were the majority of employees in that organization said that it was rife with racial bias. Every single senior manager in that organization said they saw disparaging remarks against black and brown people and other marginalized groups. And guess what? When that happened in 2015, their white president was not fired. Their white president was not sanctioned. Their white president was not asked to resign. But I was. That is the classic case of different standards applying to people based on race. In a statement, this, this is what the president of HRC, I'm sorry, the interim president, Joni Madison, said. Uh, Mr. Davis' complaint is riddled with untruths. We are confident through the legal process that it will be apparent that Mr. Davis' termination was based on clear violations of his contract and HRC's mission. And as president of HRC, he was treated fairly and equally. Notably, some of the individuals he accuses of discriminatory behavior are people of color and champions of racial equity and inclusion who provided support and guidance as Mr. David led the organization. Also, the executive committees constituted of independent directors were comprised of seven individuals, five of whom are black. So when you say it's discrimination, who, are, who specifically are you saying it? Is it? Are you saying the black folks there or others? The entire organization. Roland, we all know that you can't sprinkle a few black people in an organization and get rid of systemic race discrimination. Any black person knows that. You can't throw five or six people on a board and claim that you can't be a racist organization. But guess what? This is what HRC is not telling you. There are at least 48 people on that board, not seven. There are 48 people on that board. The majority of them are white. What they're also not telling you is that one of those black members on that board said to a guest that the organization was not ready for its first black president. Another black member of the board broke down in tears in front of black and brown members of the staff and said that the process was flawed. So the organization can't hide behind this idea that we have black people on our board so we can't engage in systemic race discrimination. We know that's not true. And we've seen that in white institution after white institution. So I don't believe anything that HRC is saying. And then furthermore, this statement that HRC issues tells us everything we need to know about the organization. I filed a 16-page federal civil rights complaint, 16 pages. On the same day, three former employees of the organization, all black and brown, told the press that the organization was rife with racial discrimination. What does the organization do? Do they conduct an independent review? Now you've heard from four people that are saying there's systemic race discrimination. Do they hire an outside law firm to do a review? No, they issued a public statement. They go on a media campaign to tarnish my name for blowing the whistle. So this organization is telling us they're not interested in addressing systemic race discrimination, because if they were, they would have issued a very different response. But instead, they're saying we won't be dissuaded or we won't be deterred from our mission. So what they're telling us is our mission does not include black and brown people, because if, they, if it did include black and brown people, we would have responded very differently. They say that you work to undermine one of the women who accused uh, Governor Cuomo. This is what the New York Times said in their story announcing your firing. Uh, Mr. David also suggested edits to a letter intended to malign Miss Boylan that was being circulated among Mr. Cuomo and his aides and said that he would collect signatures for, for it from former aides. He declined to sign it himself, however, and he later said that he did not know the extent of the allegations against Mr. Cuomo. Did you suggest uh, any letters? Were you involved in, on the communication side? You said that you were called to testify to present documents that were in your possession. Uh, do you, so were you in, involved in any way uh, with, again, suggesting edits or involved in the communications aspect? Two things there, Roland. Number one, I'm not going to be in a position to respond to the human rights campaign and their allegations when they haven't told me the basis for the termination. They were supposed to be transparent in their findings. Instead, they have their media folks talking to the New York Times behind the scenes about why they, quote, fired me.
when they haven't even told me. When you say when you say they haven't told you, what did no, you re what did, what did you receive from them? They say it was for cause. What what did they send to you? Was it a letter? Was it <laughs> what did they send to you? They sent to me a one-page letter saying that you are being terminated for cause for violating this provision and this provision of your contract. That was it. And what were those provisions? <laughs> what were those provisions of your contract? What specifically? That, that reputational damage to the organization. That was it, Roland. I wasn't told the reasons for my termination. And with respect to the specific letter you're referencing, I never drafted a letter. The Attorney General's report doesn't say that. So I'm not going to be put in a position to defend myself regarding allegations that the Human Rights Campaign is now advancing but never actually told me. Think about it. You work for an employer. The employer says, we're going to conduct this independent review and we're going to be transparent. And then the employer calls you and says, you should resign. And you say, what are the findings? And the employer says, we're not going to issue any findings. And you say, well, you have an obligation to tell me the basis for your termination. And then they fire you. What, were, what did they did they take this to mediation, arbitration? Did they try to settle? Did they offer you a severance package? Did you accept? Did you reject it? No. Answer to all of those is no. My, without getting into the details here, we actually sought to engage with this organization and get more information, and we were told their lawyers told my lawyers there is no report. There are no findings that we can share with him. This is supposed to be a civil rights organization. Where's transparency? Where's due process? Think about an organization that's putting itself out there to be a, quote, civil rights organization. And yet they're going to fire the first black president without being transparent and without honoring due process. And I said to them, Roland, if you don't want to disclose to the public your findings, you should at least disclose it to me because I'm directly affected. We're not issuing any findings. We don't believe we have an obligation to issue any findings. That was their position. Now, if I were white, this would be very different. Now, again, uh, Morgan Cox, Jody Patterson, uh, who serve as, serves as board chairs, uh, they according to their statement, they explain what the cause was. Um, and then they say uh, that an, an investigation was conducted through the executive committees of the board, constituted of the independent directors with the assistance of Sidley Austin. Following the completion of that investigation, the HRC and HRC Foundation boards of directors have voted to terminate Mr. David for cause effective immediately for violations of his contract with the human rights campaign. Uh, and then they say in here, as outlined in the New York Attorney General report, Mr. David engaged in a number of activities in December 2020 while HRC president to assist Governor Cuomo's team in responding to allegations by Ms. Boylan of sexual harassment. They say it was a conflict of interest uh, regarding the mission of HRC, uh, material damage to HRC, HRCF's interest a reputation and prospects has, has resulted or may be expected uh, to result. Um, then they, then this is what they, they, they say. This damage is evidenced by the intense media surrounding this conduct, as well as hundreds of calls, emails, and other negative communications HRC has received from staff, members of the Board of Governors, volunteers, program partners, general members, supporters, corporate partners, political figures, and more expressing serious concern with Mr. David's conduct and its, in, and its inconsistency with the values and mission of HRC. So what I'm still trying to... So you say that you were compelled to turn the information over. They say yeah. you turning the information over constituted helping Andrew Cuomo's team. Um, did you turn the information over to Andrew Cuomo's team or to the Attorney General Letitia James? Letitia James was not involved at the time, and I did mm -hmm. both. Letitia James asked for any information that I have, I provided it to her as I'm required to do by law. So when they Andrew said you suggested edits, 
where is that coming from? What, 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 so are you saying that didn't happen? And so therefore, if you say that didn't happen, wh where are they getting that from? We're talking about two separate things, Roland. So let's take, take a step back. The first is, I'm a lawyer. There are rules that apply to lawyers. And when you are responding to a request for information from your client on matters that you worked on, you have to respond. Imagine contacting your tax attorney. Well, well no, your, your, your former client, because you no longer work there. It doesn't matter. Okay. No, 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 no. My point is, my point is, you were at HRC, you were no longer working for the governor's office. It go, go ahead. Doesn't, under the rules of professional conduct, you, we don't have to guess this. The, the New York University has already said, I had a legal obligation to provide the information that was requested. This is not a guessing game. Okay. Rules exist, and they should apply to black lawyers in the same way they apply to white lawyers. So that's the first point. The second is, when the attorney general conducted her investigation, they specifically advised me that I was legally prohibited from discussing the fact that I was being interviewed or providing any information to anyone. When you say they, meaning the attorney general's office. Correct. Have you, have, and, and did you, okay, so did you get that in writing? Did you present that to HRC? Yes. And Roland, this is what's fascinating, right? HRC knew all of this. They conducted their independent review. They have this information, and yet they are now claiming, and I don't even know this statement that you're referencing. I haven't even seen it, if it recently came out. So this is something new now. The bottom line is, HRC, you conducted an independent investigation. Where's the report? Where's the findings? I shouldn't have to guess about the, the basis for your termination. They can't answer that question, Roland. It's a very simple question. Where are the findings? You conducted an independent review. Where are the findings? If you were only going to rely on the attorney general's report, there would be no need to do an independent investigation. But you did one. So where are the findings? Nowhere to be found six months later. The organization has not issued any findings. There is no report. And if I were to only compare that to what happened in 2015, when there was reputational harm, so you're telling me when someone uses the N-word twice in the organization and there is wide public scrutiny and, and, and criticism about the organization, that's not reputational harm? Um, who, who used the N-word? There was a vice president working at the human rights campaign. That person used the N word twice. When, when you were you, president, or, or, were you president before you became president? So the former president was running the org, a white man, and during the course of his tenure, there was a report called the Pipeline Report, and in that report, they had interviewed employees in the organization. They had interviewed every single manager. And they said, the majority of employees said, that the organization was rife with racial bias. Every single senior manager in the organization said that they had heard or witnessed disparaging remarks or comments regarding minority employees. They said that the minority employees said that they were tokenized in the organization. Fast forward a few years later, one of the senior managers uses the N-word twice in the organization. What happens to the president of the organization at that time? What happens to the white president? Nothing. This what, is all in the press. What happened to the person who used the N-word? Were they fired? That person was fired. Got it. The president, who was overseeing the organization during this entire time, stays. When you asked about the statement, so this was sent to us uh, from the uh, communications folks with HRC. Uh, the first statement that I read from Joni Madison was date, is dated February 3rd, uh, 2022. The second statement from the board chairs is dated September 6, uh, 2021. Uh, also in here, they sent us the email that was sent in September to the staff regarding uh, your termination uh, as well. And then there also was a statement 
uh, that they, when they announced the um, Borland investigation uh, on August 9th, 2021. So those were the, those were the statements that they sent. I'm still trying to understand um, where they said that you suggested edits to a letter that you refused to sign, but you were going to get others to sign on for. Um, where did that come from? What, you know, what, what are they talking there, about? Those are separate issues as well. There was a letter that someone in the governor's office drafted that they asked me and three other employees to sign, which we refused to sign. And I articulated to them why I was not going to sign the letter. The letter included facts or information that I couldn't verify. I wasn't there. I didn't have any personal knowledge. So they, 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 were, they were drafting a letter of former aides of Cuomo to show that, that they, they, they stand with him and support him. Yes. That was a letter? That, that's a separate letter. So Okay, so the, I'm, trying, I'm trying to understand. Written, they are accusing you of suggesting edits to a letter that you correct. didn't want to sign, but you said you would get other people to actually sign the letter. What are they talking... Like, what... Are, what did you suggest any edits? Did you, what are they talking okay. about? Is that true or Hold false? Hold on. Let, let's take a step back again. I was contacted along with a few other employees regarding signing in a letter regarding a former employee. Before, but before or after you cooperated with the investigation? This is before there was ever an investigation. Got it. Okay. This is before the attorney general was ever involved. Right? So I'm contacted regarding a letter that they're looking to have other people sign. Said, I'm not going to sign this letter. I don't know anything about some of the facts or references you're making. So they say, fine, and say, why? I articulate all the reasons. They then came up with different letters over time. And the letter shifted from a letter focused on an individual to a letter that was actually talking about positive experiences people had within the administration. That is very different than what was forwarded to me originally. Got the it. HRC knows, like, this is not a secret. They know this. But what they're trying to do is conflate the facts. And again, why are we, you and I, having a conversation about what HRC knew or didn't know? Why didn't they issue their report? They should have issued a report that was clearly articulating the facts as they saw them to determine whether or not my actions actually violated their policies. But they haven't done that. And they also fail to recognize that I am a lawyer. And I had a legal obligation to respond to the governor and to the governor's office regarding matters that I worked on. The letter that was submitted to me related to a matter I worked on. There's rules regarding the conduct of lawyers. And you can't apply a different rule to a black lawyer than a white lawyer. And what happened here is HRC simply panicked. Rather than going through the process and applying the applicable rules, they panicked. And they still can't explain why they are not addressing the issue of systemic race discrimination within the organization. They're silent on that. Instead, they're saying we won't be distracted from the work that we're doing. Well. I hope that the work that you're doing relates to black and brown people. But it clearly is not. And that is one of the most important reasons why I'm filing this lawsuit. Last question, um, and that is, you talked about what was rampant uh, when you were president. First of all, for the public, how long were you president? I was president for two years. When you were president, did you launch any initiative that specifically uh, targeted uh, any investigation or whatever to deal with what you descri describe as rampant racism in HRC? Oh, yes. <laughs> Several. I asked them to do a pay equity study because we determined that there were pay disparities within the organization where women, black and brown people were being paid differently than white people. And during the course of my tenure, before that could be implemented, I was fired. Second, the HR process within HRC was so broken that black and brown employees didn't actually want to go to HR, so much so that I told them that the HR manager could not stay within that position anymore and implemented new systems 
to make sure that, that employees felt that their issues would actually get addressed through HR. And then I learned subsequently that issues were still being withheld from me, even though I had implemented these changes. The problem within the organization is so deeply rooted, and this will all come out during litigation, because I have emails, I have voicemails, I have evidence to support the case that I've submitted to the court. And this will all come out. HRC is hiding behind this veneer of secrecy, right? It's, it's an organization that has been operating in secrecy for such a long time. And now I'm challenging systemic racial bias within the organization. And I have emails, again, from donors that were criticizing me for talking about Black Lives Matter. I have emails and voicemails from people that are saying, why are we focusing on black and brown issues? These are their donors. They can't, they can't run away from that at this point. You say you, they, said, you said you have emails from donors asking, why are we focusing on black and brown issues? Correct. I have emails from donors specifically saying, I no longer want to be a part of the human rights campaign. After I submitted, a, I, I sent out a letter highlighting why black lives matter. And there are certain donors that said they no longer want to be a part of the organization because I was making that a focus. And how did the board members respond to that? This is real, Roland. This is affecting the lives of so many LGBTQ black and brown people working in that organization. And for them to try to erase us, for them to try to pretend that this is not a real issue is offensive. Oh, no, no, I, I know it's real. I mean, when you get the brother in uh, Charlotte who became the first leader of the largest uh, LGBT organization there who uh, resigned uh, because he, uh, he had folks who were white, uh, who were LGBT, who were writing him, who was writing him saying, I'm not working with somebody who's black. Um, look, you know, I, it, you know, like I've covered this issue. I've had brothers and sisters on, on my show, my TV one show who are, uh, same gender loving, who have talked about this as well. Uh, we, we, you know, we dealt with this here when, uh, you know, when glad came after me, uh, we, we raised those issues too, in terms of the coverage of where black folks were saying, Hey, um, you know, how, you know, where are you including folks? And in fact, when, you know, we've had discussions even on these shows about black issues that come up where LGBT. BT groups have wanted black civil rights groups to stand with them, but then black folks are like, well, where are you when it comes to the issues? In fact, when I remember, if I remember correct, when I was in North Carolina, I actually said that, uh, I, I, I might, actually, I think I might specifically even say it, where's HRC? And that was a young brother. I said, bro, I'm not talking about you. Because I'm talking about your national organization. Black folks were here for the trans bill. I uh, were against that, voting against that. I said, where are white LGBT folks on issues that matter to black folks? So, so this is actually, so that, that has been an ongoing issue that's been talked about and covered. So yeah, I'm absolutely uh, familiar with that uh, as well. Um, what's the next step for you? What's next? I continue to work on behalf of marginalized communities. I've done this for more than 20 years and this episode is not going to dissuade me from continuing my mission in this life. I believe that God put me on this, on this earth to do something meaningful for marginalized communities. And I've been committed to that for more than 20 years in the private sector, the public sector, the not-for-profit sector. So that work will continue. And um, I am proud to do this work. Uh, and, I, and I see this legal challenge as just an extension of that. Um, Roland, after representing people for more than 20 years and having this show up on my doorstep, I had to really think hard about what do you do now? Do you look the other way and go and take another job and forget this ever happened? And I decided I couldn't look at myself in the mirror because I've met with too many plaintiffs. I've consulted with too many people about injustices, indifference and discrimination, and I've worked with them to try to seek redress in court. And now it was happening to me. And I feel I have an obligation as a civil rights lawyer who's been doing this work for a long time to see this through. So I'm gonna see through this lawsuit and I'm gonna continue the work that I've been doing for more than two decades. All right, Alfonso David, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, I wanna bring in my panel right now. 
uh, have them uh, here. I uh, want to talk about uh, what we just discussed uh, and some other issues uh, as well. So uh, joining me right now, Mustafa Santiago, Santiago Ali, uh, formerly with the EPA. Glad to have you on the show. Uh, Teresa Lundy, TML Communications out of Philadelphia. Thanks a bunch. Demario Solomon Simmons, civil rights attorney, founder, Justice for Greenwood. So, Teresa, I want to start with you. This is interesting here, uh, looking at this uh, particular case here, uh, what Alfonso lays out. He says, if you fired me for cause, then, and if you had an investigation, present the report. Um, you talk about transparency. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, should they public, publicly release a report where they investigated the allegations and then determined that uh, it was true? Should they? Well, I am not a, uh, a legal expert here. No, no, no that's I... legal. But I'm talking about this, this is communications. Because well, if, so if, the... if, you, if, you, if you release statements saying he was fired for cause, uh, you had an investigation, uh, well, should you ha release a report that actually details that? Who did you talk to? How did you come to that conclusion? Things along those lines. I think it could be internal. So, I mean, if they wanted to release it to him and then um, Alfonso then wanted to release it to the public, that's a different story. I'm not sure if it really needed to be a, a public transcript. I think he because he didn't receive it, was the issue. And then that's probably what I think really on that. I don't necessarily think it needed to be a public um, report on why he was fired. I know I wouldn't want a public report of why I'm fired. I would want it in my email box if I was fired. But I think for him not to get it, I think that's a little disconcerting. Demario, um, again, he, he says that because he served as an attorney for Andrew Cuomo, when they were, he was asked uh, to submit information, he had no choice. He says that he was told by the attorney general, do not share with anyone your participation in this. He said, as a result, he couldn't tell HRC that he had been called uh, or compelled uh, to give a testimony, deposition, or whatever. Uh, your thoughts? Well, good to see everybody. Um, I don't know the specifics of the New York state laws, there are some processes that if he was a part of a grand jury investigation, that yes, it has to be public. It has to be private. My question was going to be, if I had the opportunity, did he actually receive a subpoena? You know, when you say you're compelled to do something, usually that means you received a subpoena. Because if the, in my understanding, in my experience, if they just ask you for ask you for documents, you have the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to provide this to you. It, but I didn't uh, get the it, opportunity it, to it, it, even, even, even if you served as counsel for the governor? See, again, I don't know the specifics of New York law to, to be a pine on that. I am not familiar myself of you working for a client and a client and, and a third party ask you for documents. Normally it's the client who has to waive what we call the attorney client privilege. So in other words, Roland, if I'm representing you and then uh, Mustafa wants me to give you some documents, give some documents that I worked on for you, that's attorney-client privilege, and you would have to be the one to say, yeah, DeMario, go ahead and give those documents to Mustafa. Now, I don't know, again, the specifics of New York law. Well, he, was a, he, he worked for the governor's staff, meaning he was a state employee. So this was, not, this, was not, this was not like he was the personal attorney for the governor. Yeah, again, from my understanding, I got you. If, he were, if he were to receive a subpoena, then absolutely, he has to provide any documents that he has in his in his possession. But if they just ask him for the documents, based upon my knowledge uh, uh, and not knowing New York specific laws, I don't know why he would be compelled or have to give that particular information. That's number one. Number two, on the issue of, of actually releasing the report, I think it's important, again, every state has laws on what can be released on people's employment background. Plus, there were probably other individuals who were investigated or who were interviewed whose information would have been in the report and you would have been violating their privacy if you released that report publicly. At least that's what it would be here in Oklahoma and the other locations where I'm familiar with. Um, what jumps out here, um, um, Mustafa, is 
Um, again, th th this back and forth. HRC contends everything was done right. He was informed. He had an opportunity to respond um, that, and, and, and all of that. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but clearly uh, he is saying, no, you fired me because you discriminated against me. Well, he's asking for transparency. We have to remember that his reputation has now taken a hit from this. And if he is asking folks, okay, bring forward the report. One, let me see what's in it. And then I guess he would make a decision then if he wanted to share that with the broader audience. I know that he now has a, a case that's pending. So I'm sure that they would want to keep that information uh, until that plays out over time. You know, I, I've seen these different types of situations on the federal level. Uh, where we've been asked because we worked on a particular issue or we were part of a particular subject that we had to bring forward information uh, for those who were doing an analysis for, you know, possible actions. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it's going to play out over time, but I'm sure he would like to have the opportunity uh, to, as he said, to know why he was fired. For folks should be very clear if you're being uh, fired from a position um, what is it that I, you know, one of the reasons that you that you are saying that I'm no longer fit to lead this said organization? And the reason I was asking about the letter, what they were talking about, because this is what the Washington Post wrote. David was fired from HRC in September, weeks after New York Attorney General Letitia James revealed that he had helped seek signatories for a letter that sought to undermine the accusations of Cuomo's first sexual harassment accuser, Lindsey Boylan. That letter was part of an effort that amounted to, quote, unlawful retaliation according to a report on Cuomo's behavior by James's office. Uh, and so that's why I'm like, okay, what letter are we actually talking about? Did he seek signatories? He said, well, a letter changed over time. But you have the governor's office saying that he sought signatures for this letter. You know, I, I think what's important here, I, I have no doubt that this brother dealt with some racism because racism is a part of America and this, and this company is a part of America. I think what's really important here, Roland, for everyone that's listening, something that the brother said that really stuck, stood out to me. He said, I have evidence. I have emails. I have text messages. I have documents. So I would say for everyone that's listening to this show tonight, and when you're experiencing this racism on the job, Keep the evidence. Keep the receipts, because you're going to need that. He can say whatever he wants to say. We can say whatever we want to say. But he's in federal court now. He's probably bringing a Title VII case or a 1981 case. I do those cases all the time. He's going to need corroboration. He's going to need that evidence to prove if, in fact, he was fired for, for cause. See, a lot of people that work, they work in what's called at-will state. You can be fired for any reason, as long as it's not racist or sexist. But he has a contract that said he had to be fired for cause. And that's why it's vitally important for him to see why was I actually fired, and then for him to have the evidence and the documents to back up that he should not have been fired without cause, or with cause. All right, then. Well, we'll see what the next step is uh, when HRC responds. All right, folks, got to go to a break. When we come back, uh, Roller Barton on the filter. We're talking about the Supreme Court. I, uh, the schizophrenic Supreme Court, OK? They make a ruling regarding the constitutionality of districts in Alabama, but didn't they just rule like a year or two ago that they don't get involved in partisan gerrymandering? Uh, what the hell is going on? Uh, we'll talk about that next. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy, 
why black women are deeper in student loan debt than anyone else. I wanted to be the next Connie Chung. Nothing was going to get in my way. What was placed in front of me was a promissory note that said that, hey, if you sign this document, you can be able to achieve your dream. Not really understanding the full foresight of what I was going to be experiencing right after college. Learn how you can turn it around and get wealthy in the process. Right here on Black Star Network with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, host of Get Wealthy. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. The time is always right to do what is right. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All right, folks, the Supreme Court uh, rejects an Alabama ruling requiring states to redraw congressional districts before the 2022 elections. Uh, actually, what they've done, they've actually uh, stayed uh, that decision by the federal courts. It boosts Republican chances to hold six of the state's seven seats in the House of Representatives. Now, uh, the high court's five to four vote means next elections will fall under the Republican controlled legislature's map drawn with one majority black district represented by uh, Congresswoman Terry Sewell in a state where, uh, of course, more than a quarter of the population is black. Now, here's the deal here. The, the, the federal courts rule that the maps in Georgia, excuse me, Alabama, were unconstitutional, violating the Voting Rights Act because African-Americans were not being properly represented. They basically said there should have been the creation of a second district. By staying that, the problem now is they got to seek uh, they got to seek actually, um, you know, responses from both sides. So tomorrow, by the time they actually hear that, the primaries have already started. Now, Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts joined the liberal justices in this case. And what's also interesting uh, here is that, again, they, 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 they're stepping into a gerrymandering situation where they previously ruled that, oh, the Supreme Court, we have no jurisdiction with political gerrymandering. Now, all of a sudden, what? We're changing? That's all what happens. That's also what happens when you have a six to three conservative majority. And so even if Roberts flips to the other side, conservatives still hold a 5 4 lead. And that's what the great Dr. Nellie Fuller Jr., his quote to say if you, if you don't understand white supremacy and racism, what it is and how it works, everything else will only confuse you. This is what this was about. The fact that they didn't jump into the North Carolina situation because it was going to benefit black people. And the fact that they jumped into the Alabama situation because it's going to be a detriment to black people. The Supreme Court, the 63 Supreme Court that Mitch McConnell put through utilizing every tool and all the power that he had as the majority leader was for these reasons right here, for this reason right, uh, right here as we see in uh, real time. They want to do everything they can to, to cement minority rule for America. That is the problem. That is the purpose and the, the, the goal of the Republican uh, Party at this point. It is to con continue and cement minority rule, white rule against all non-whites, period. And they have a 63 Supreme Court. And guess what? The Democrats are not fighting hard enough against this. We have not used every tool that's available to them. And it's going to put black people's lives at further harm and risk. When you say how we use every tool, what other tools do you use? Listen, I'm not a political, but with every tool that's to be used. No, but I'm, been, but I'm asking you. Know, said, you no, I'm you're, you're, you. Hold up. You said we have give to use every tool. Okay, give, give, me give me some tools. Give me a chance. From day one, you know I've said this should have been the top priority. The top priority should have been voting rights and expanding the court. 
expanding the court should have been a top priority. You already knew that you were going to lose these these decisions six to three because it's already gerrymandered at the court. Okay, but Demario, so how you going? How you going? How, how you going expa expand? How you going? How you going expand the courts when you had the votes? You have they even asked to do it? Can you first ask? My grandma said, first, first ask and you will receive. Have they even asked to expand the courts? They don't. Roland? They have don't they have even a, asked to They don't have the votes. But they haven't even tried. Demario. Who cares? It, Demario, if you, if you ain't got the votes on Build Back Better, if you ain't got the votes on uh, the George Floyd Justice Act, if you ain't got the votes on the For the People Act, as well as for the John Lewis Act, you ain't got the votes on expanding the Supreme Court. Okay, but you still got to try. If black folks, if black folks decided okay. we ain't got the opportunity to be successful because we, then what? Would, why would we continue to fight? Why but do if I you don't have the, but if you don't have the votes, Oklahoma and racist Oklahoma. If I'm gonna say, well, the courts are, are if, racist. If you can't, racist, Demario, you can't to fight. If you can't get through low hanging fruit, you ain't gonna get to high fruit. Hey. I, I'm saying that they need to choose every opportunity to try to get us an opportunity to win. And if you know that the Supreme Court is six to three, from out the gate, that should have been something that should have been on the agenda, top of line. Not some type of commission that took six months to come back and say, well, we don't know if we should expand the courts or not. No, the Democrats should have been on front and center saying, we have to expand the courts, otherwise we will get screwed you with don't these six have decisions enough. at the crucial time. You don't, and this is the point and I, I hear you, but here's the deal. The Democratic Party, I keep saying this, Mustafa, unlike the Republican Party, you have far more different positions on the Democratic side. You've got centrist, you've got moderate, you've got progressive, you got ultra-liberal, you got all... It's, it's like you got rainbow going over there. On the right, it's right, hard right. That's it. So the point is, I, I agree with you. I think they should expand the court. The vote simply ain't there. Well, I think we got to continue to push them. We can't I, I, them no, I, no, I, no, 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 hold on, hold on. You said continue to push them. No, what you have to do is you have to actually expand the majority. Because right, as it's presently oh. constituted, as it's presently constituted, 50-50, the votes are not there. It's, it's, look, math is math. It ain't new math. It ain't alternative math. And so that's what that's where we are right now in terms of where you're dealing with this court. It's 50-50. If one person says nope, it's all dead, Mustafa. Well, I understand where Brother Mario is coming from, that he wants us to actually utilize our power, but to build that power means that we gotta better educate our communities on how critical the courts are, from the Supreme Court all the way down and how our vote can translate into making sure that we actually have some fairness inside of the courts uh, and to make sure that when the laws are being interpreted, that they're not just, you know, right-leaning, which we see now from the conservative judges uh, that are out there, that make the job of getting justice so much more difficult. Um, so we have work to do in actually making the investments and teaching young people and students you know, how important the courts are and how we utilize our vote to get there and then all the way up, um, you know, to our elders, who some of them know because they lived through the 60s and the 50s. Um, but, you know, that's a part of this, this overall set of well, how do we build and how do we get the tools? First of all, it's helping people to understand how valuable the courts are in our lives. Teresa, um, with this, what we're dealing with here, and again, you're seeing wins. The difference here is this. This federal, this federal uh, panel made its decision based upon a violation of the Voting Rights Act. The reason you are seeing the successes in North Carolina and Ohio, because those state Supreme Courts ruled. That's also what we have to keep in mind. When we're talking about, okay, we're talking about, you know, obviously the Supreme Court, but when we ignore those state Supreme Courts, that also impacts it because that's where decisions are also being made. I mean, you know this in Pennsylvania. I was, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it was such an important election here in PA um, in 2017 when, you know, we were actually trying to get, and I was on that campaign, trying to get the uh, second African-American um, uh, on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, he definitely did win the, you know, uh, Democratic Party support. But 
again, we also lost that seat to a Republican. So, you know, when some of these cases, like like you said, Roland, are taken to the federal level, they first have to make a pit stop. And that pit stop is in your state. So, you know, when people are looking at, you know, these elections that's every four years, we also have to look at the, the judges' elections because they are so important. But I think, you know, as Brother Musafa had already stated, education and educating people about what these seats that the judges present um, and some of those civil rights and, you know, and some of the voting rights and some of these issues. I mean, look at Bill Cosby. He's out, right, because of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, not the federal Supreme Court, um, ruled in his favor. So there's so many things that happen at a local level. And, and even though it's not a, a local community type of situation, some of the issues that come up statewide are local problems that can um, either, you know, uh, change some of the some of the uh, dynamics that's on the federal side, or keep it um, the same on the local side. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, go. Another aspect of what I said they can use more power, like here in Oklahoma, right? We have two very racist conservative senators who will not want to block any judge that the Biden administration may want to put forth. But they haven't put forth anybody yet. And that's like that in a lot of red states, where they're waiting for these conservative senators to, to acquiesce and say, OK, we will bless this particular individual to be an actual, uh, what we call an Article Three judge. We need them to move forward the way Trump did and nominate people, even in red states, put them on the bench right now while we do have the votes. But they while are. They do have the, 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 that, actually, that is happening. In fact, in fact, I haven't heard Oklahoma. Okay, in, fa in fact, well, well, his, his, in fact, what Senator Dick Durbin has done, what he, what he said is, he said same thing y'all did under Trump. We gonna do. He's not allowing them to submit blue slips where if if a where if a senator submits a blue slip and say, that that then they say hey they hold off uh, on that particular uh, nominee. He said. We're using the same rules uh, that, that y'all have done. That's why uh, Biden has not actually nominated and confirmed the highest number of federal judges in one year uh, than any president in history. And 24% and of the federal judges that he has appointed have been African-American. Yeah, but Roller, you got to look where that, and that's a great stat overall, but look at the states, look at the red states, look at the Mississippis, the Alabamas, the, the Texases, the Oklahomas, those states where we need the more progressive judges more than any place. Those people are not on the docket. And we're now in, almost into the second month, halfway have, to the second have, month. But, of but what, how, what, well, how many open positions in those places as federal Several. judges? Because part of, part of the deal here is you, you can only put someone forward if you have a vacancy in those states. So how, how many how many federal ju judicial vacancies are there in Oklahoma? There are at least three judicial vacancies in Oklahoma that's necessary, particularly with the McGirt ruling where we have the Native American uh, reservations having more power. Our court systems are jam-packed. They are bringing judges all around the nation. In fact, my my deputy director is on jury duty right now. With, and so judges are coming from all over the place and lawyers. Joe, uh, Joe, um, Roland, right now, we don't have a permanent U.S. attorney here in the Northern District of Oklahoma that's been nominated by this administration and pushed through. I'm telling you, they're not going as strong and as fast as necessary. We need to put as many progressives on the ju judiciary bench right now, right now, right now. So I'm looking here uh, at the uh, various, I'm pulling up right now, uh, the federal vacancies, um, current federal judicial vacancies uh, that lay that lays it out, um, and then I'm trying to see. Right, give me one second. I gotta cancel this here. So we got. Uh, okay, so in the go to my computer, please. Do you see it? Um, all right. Not sure why this map is not uh, coming up. But I'm seeing. Why are you doing it? Let me tell you something. I'm, I'm, hold on, hold on, hold on. Vacancy. Uh, hold on. In the western portion of Oklahoma, there are zero federal vacancies. In the eastern portion of Oklahoma, it says there are zero federal vacancies. Uh, then it says in the northern uh, district, it says there are. Tw it's it's twenty five percent, but that doesn't. That's percentage, but it doesn't tell me. How many positions that is? But let me explain uh, and that. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
in Louisiana, uh, I'm looking at, I'm going through here, I'm looking at, I'm looking at percentage of vacancies. Uh, so like in Mississippi, southern Mississippi, 0% vacancies. Northern Mississippi says 33. Uh, and then um, you have in Alabama, there's only one section of Alabama where you have vacancies. Uh, you do not have, for the other four areas, for the other three areas of Alabama, uh, there are no vacancies. Go ahead. Yeah, but so the vacancies are by percentages, but also we have to understand some inside baseball here. When you have judges who are on what's called senior status, okay, they may not have actually retired, but they're on senior status. They're not actually taking cases. So they may take one or two cases, and they're waiting for a new replacement to come on. So technically, there is no vacancy, but they're not actually actually hearing cases. This is what I'm talking about. This is the type of education as my sister They may not stated, be hearing cases, but, but they still have to retire. But this is a, but this how this works is when they know to have somebody is going to replace them. This is what Republicans do so much better than Democrats. No, actually, what actually, what the Republicans did, what the Republicans do, is go to people, push and prod them to retire. What you had exactly. is, and, and, but 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 that actually has been happening as well. You are, I'm with you. You want it to be faster. Uh, but, again, when you look at the actual numbers that have actually been confirmed, again, you can appoint all day. You still got to get them confirmed. That's also a fundamental issue. Uh, and so that's one, of the, that's one of the things that they also have done. And so they've done a... This administration has done a hell of a lot better job than previous ones when it came to pushing federal judges. Absolutely. And so, right, like, for instance, I'm right here. If you go to my... Um, I'm not quite sure why... Uh, let me just see why we're not why we're not seeing my uh, computer here. Let's see if this will do it. Uh, hopefully, this does it. So this here is a press release uh, that the White House submitted uh, January nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two, uh, where uh, he announced uh, thirteen. The next round, um, uh, thirteen. Uh, the additional judges, and these were judges uh, that were for uh, Court of Appeals uh, here, then you go here for Western District of Washington, Eastern District of New York, Eastern District of California, Southern District of California, Eastern District of New York, Southern District of New York, District of Colorado, uh, those were the ones for January uh, 19th. Uh, so, look. What did all those states have in common? What do you mean? What did all those states have? Are those, any of those red states? Any of those states were? No, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. See, you can be, you can be, a, you can be a red state or a blue state, but depending upon what the, the federal federal judicial area, there could also be a red area of a blue state. We we got to remember, okay? Michigan is a blue state, but outside of two or three cities, that's Alabama. Pennsylvania is a blue state, but outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. That's Alabama. And so that's the other deal as well. You have areas of those states where you have that are very conservative. So if you talk about Western New York, upstate New York, that ain't like, you know, super blue. So you have that as well. And so I, I understand your I understand your point. What I'm also saying is you've got areas in state like you take Minnesota. Minnesota used to be a hardcore blue state. It's a lot of red outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So we got to just recognize how these things are happening uh, as well. Hold tight one second. We come back. We got to talk about this case out of Philadelphia. So, excuse me, out of Pennsylvania. Remember the, the Jamaican immigrant shot and killed by these four white guys? Well, apparently a camera could have captured what took place. When we come back, we're going to talk with his mother. Folks, you don't want to miss this. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, support what we do. Get the app, Black Star Network. Uh, folks, we are, I just got the text message, we are about 100 and, what, 153? 153 or so away from uh, hitting 30,000 downloads. So uh, let's get it going. Download on your Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Xbox, and Samsung Smart TV as well. You can su support our Bring the Funk fan club, uh, folks, uh, of course, at Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered, Pay Pals are Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. So please uh, hit us there. Uh, and uh, we come back again. You don't, don't want to miss this conversation we have next, folks. Uh, we'll be back in a moment.
am Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Defining myself as opposed to being defined by others is one of the most difficult challenges I face. Politician and lawyer, Carol Mosley Brown. All right, folks, uh, we always focus on black and missing. Uh, here is uh, Alex uh, Alex Alexandria Gant. She's 5'6", weighs 127 pounds. Uh, hair is brown. Uh, eye color is brown. Uh, she's been missing from Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York. Uh, folks, any information, please call the Rochester Police Department, 585-428-6666, 585-428-6666. This, this story out of Pennsylvania. We have been uh, covering this uh, for uh, for some time. It is an extremely uh, strange story, a strange story, and that is, um, you know, Jamaican immigrant Peter Spencer who was shot nine times um, when he um, went uh, on whether it was a hunting trip. I don't know what they actually call it uh, with uh, with some uh, colleagues. He was the only black person on this December camping trip the former co-worker. Now, no one has been arrested. The white men are claiming self-defense and there are reports of a surveillance camera at the cabin where Spencer was murdered. There's no word on the, if there's anything on that video or if any video even exists. We reached out to the Venango County District Attorney, Sean White, for a statement. We have not gotten a response. Joining us now uh, is from Pennsylvania, Peter Spencer's mother, uh, Isilda Spencer Henry, and the chair of the Allegheny County Democratic uh, Caucus, William Anderson. Glad to have both of you here. Um, and so, just to, so is that correct, Isilda? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, want to make sure you get the, get the name right. All right. So, let's talk about this uh, this surveillance camera. How did y'all find out that there was a camera there? So, so um, the, the the surveillance camera was actually discovered during an investigation by our local um, reporter, uh, Chandy Chapman from WTAE, their investigative reporter went out to Venango County to the address um, where Peter was dropped off, and then he discovered there were surveillance cameras outside of um, the, the location. So, um, so again, it was a camping trip with coworkers. Uh, did he know all of the people there or just the one former, former coworker? Well, so well, we're we're really not sure. Um, you know, we know that we know that the coworker when he was dropped off at that that we recognize that the coworker was recognized Nathan Myers, but we're not sure whether you know he knew the other people that were there. Um, so what is still baffling to us, I said, is how your son can be shot nine times and. The folks who there had guns, no one gets taken out to the police station. Really crazy. I had some that question that there's a man who was shot nine times. No one else got shot, but at the same time, no one is held accountable for it. So I stand up and argued with the police. I said, You're not doing your work. So, um, what has been the response? Uh, we, I reached out to 
Um, sent an email to the Jamaican ambassador to the United States. Have not heard from him. Um, what have y'all heard from uh, Jamaican officials? Uh, have they pressed the Biden administration, uh, the Department of Justice, to get involved in this case? Well, actually, a few weeks ago, I traveled um, to Washington, D.C., and went to the Jamaican embassy myself. And I spoke to the um, chief security officer and asked that exact question. Right? I went to D.C. because when we had met with them um, a week prior, they had promised to send me an email updating me on what they were doing to demand justice for Peter Spencer. So when I went to the embassy and I spoke with the, um, the security general, they still didn't have any answers. They told me that you know they were they were aware of the situation and that basically the same thing that the that our news reporter reported. So they didn't give me any affirmative answers of what they were what they were doing. So I continued to press them. So I was um, given a phone number and told that the embassy in New York is actually the embassy that is in charge of this and that the consul general. Um, Allison Wilson is the person that I need to contact, which I have contacted several times this week, and uh, and I'm currently waiting a response. But our, our next move is to go to um, go to the embassy in New York to demand action and demand immediate justice. As Peter Spencer was not an American citizen, he was a citizen of Jamaica that came to this country, you know, seeking all the glories of our country, and we are, you know, demanding that the government that is supposed to represent him represent him. Uh, I still don't. I mean, do you feel? I mean, does it bother you that, at Frank, that uh, Jamaican officials are dragging their feet on this? That they're not? Uh, because I mean, we've seen other cases uh, that have involved foreign nationals where their country's officials were very aggressive uh, in getting involved. They have been involved. Um, to my knowledge, a few that I've spoken with. They have been trying their very best. They've written letters to Josh Shapiro, I mean, emails and all of that, requesting for the um, the transfer of the case from Venango County and all of that. So um, we're, they're really putting a foot down it. They keep calling me and um, talking with me and everything like that. So we just have to press a little more. I think I have to call lady, the ambassador, the counselor herself, because she did call me and talk to me a, a couple of times. So I'll have to get back to her also. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I just think is that's that's critically important uh, for them to uh, to be more to, to be very much involved, uh, because if, if they then begin to put pressure uh, as uh, as a nation, then all of a sudden that begins uh, to impact this uh, and change this uh, yeah. as well. Um, so as it stands right now, the, uh, the four men uh, who were involved, they're walking around free. I mean, is, is there an actual investigation taking place? Who's actually leading this investigation? Uh, is it the local DA in Allegheny County? Is it the state? I mean, what's going on? So currently, it's, you know, this case is in the Allegheny County case, right? We're in Allegheny County. We're, rep we're residents of Allegheny County. Um, you know, Peter was a resident of Allegheny County, but they, this happened in Venango County. So, so we're needing pressure from everybody. All the officials from Allegheny County need to be calling out to the Venango County District Attorney, Deshaun White, and demand that he turn this case over to Attorney General Josh Shapiro. So because of the laws in Pennsylvania, without the, that reference of the case to the Attorney General, the Attorney General cannot get involved with this case. So we're demanding that you know, everyone get involved. You know, we need to hear from elected officials in Allegheny County and across, um, you know, across the country and across the world to put pressure on the, the Venango County District Attorney so that we can get justice for this family, right? Uh, it's been almost two months. Tahila Spencer is Peter Spencer's brother. He also joins us. Uh, Tahila, just uh, just uh, your thoughts about uh, this case and um, and what's going on. Yep, you're there. We got you. Talk. Go ahead and talk. Uh, I think you're on mute. Thought I turned it there up. you go. Now you're good now. Go ahead. Hey, how you guys doing? My name is Tahila Spencer. I'm Peter's brother. Um, 
I, I don't I don't know what what did you guys uh, well, no, what, what, what I asked is I mean obviously um, is this is this has been two months uh, and not enough uh, has been done um, you know w what are you asking uh, folks uh, to do what is it that you want um, uh, to happen uh, whether it's the uh, Jamaican government or Department of Justice yeah uh, we haven't we haven't heard any response yet from like the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Honorable uh, Andrew Honus, and we, you know, we're expecting, you know, someone to uh, stand up for, you know, a Jamaican brethren that was basically uh, cut down, his life was cut down so short. This, this whole thing is definitely, you can, you can see the whole thing from a mile away. It's definitely a weird, a weird situation, a weird case. They're playing, um, I feel like they're playing mind games with us, the way, the way they're handling it. And it's just weird the way it's being handled. So definitely so, somebody needs to step in. Somebody needs to stand up for my brother. Um, somebody with, with authority that actually can, you know, help us get the answers that we're looking for. Honestly, we just want, I really just want to know what happened. I really, I really just want to know. And the people that did this get brought to justice, you know. And, and um, so other than that, like, I don't know. You know, anything I, like I've said before and, and nothing I can do can bring my brother back at this point. Like I said, I don't know if anything, like I said, anything at all will, still will bring me any kind of consolation or any kind of closure at this point, but something has to be done. Yeah, I mean, look, someone is shot nine times and killed. You certainly want answers. Uh, and so far, we do not have uh, enough answers. Let me thank uh, all three of you uh, for being with us. Please keep us updated uh, on what goes on with this particular case. It certainly uh, makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, you, you just don't go camping with somebody and you get shot nine times and it's no big deal, nothing, like as if that was sort of an accident. That just makes no sense whatsoever. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. I agree totally. And, and we just want to, you know, let the mom to let tell the world what type of person, you know, people and how with his drink, some of his dreams were coming to this country. <laughs> Peter was always an affectionate person, um, very caring. People might think that because it's my son, I'm trying to... Um, put uh, put over, but it's not because we hear from people that I've never met before that I don't know, and that's the same thing they come with. Um, he's a person who work hard for whatever he have or whatever he want to attain. He put his shoulder to the wheel. Um, his friend would say, oh, this little manga picnic is so strong. To what he lift, he's not afraid to lift or to do whatever he has to do to make his living. He was a construction worker. He was a salesman. He was also a chef <laughs> where we all cook together, you know, and make everybody happy. And he's passionate about whatever he have in his dreams and he go after it. He don't just speak and stand back. He worked towards it. All right, then. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, and again, uh, keep us abreast, and we'll do all that we can as well to help help uh, all of you get answers to this uh, uh, to this uh, sad story. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, folks, uh, Raphael Warnock, U.S. Senator, pastor, uh, of course, Ebenezer Baptist Church there in Atlanta. Uh, he is running for re-election for a full six-year term to the United States Senate, and he has dropped his first campaign ad for his re-election bid. Watch this. People are tired. People have seen what they worked their entire lives to build turned upside down at a moment's notice. They're wondering when things will get back to normal, and at the same time, not knowing what normal even means anymore. At my heart, I am and always will be a pastor. That means going to work for my congregation. It means understanding the challenges you face and then doing my best to make a difference. Every day, I carry your concerns with me. That's why I've worked so hard to protect and create jobs. That's why I know we must make health care more affordable. That's why I'm cracking down on the corporations who are raising prices out of control. 
What I want the people of Georgia to know is that I see you. I hear you. I am you. I understand the work that I was sent to the Senate to do. That's what I intend to keep doing for Georgia. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message. Well, the one thing we did not see there, uh, Mustafa, the puppy, uh, that was uh, ubiquitous in many of his ads when he was running uh, in 2020. Obviously, when you run as an incumbent, it's a little bit different. Of course, he's going to be facing a stern test there. Republicans want to take him out. They're running um, several folks. Herschel Walker uh, is the Donald Trump choice on that side. Uh, polls are showing us a very tight race there. Uh, and so uh, this is going to be one of the critical seats Democrats must hold if they want to expand their uh, majority in the U.S. Senate. Well, you know, first of all, um, Governor Warnock's ad is, is spot on, especially for Georgia, not just in Georgia. That message plays all across our country. I'm looking forward to the time when he uh, and Herschel Walker are debating each other so that folks can see <laughs> the a serious so and significant folk, difference. So, so the folks can see Herschel up there talking, <laughs> and uh, I don't know what the Voting Rights Act is. <laughs> yeah, N not even his, uh, you know, uh, Brother Walker's lack of articulation. That You know, that is what it is. Everybody hasn't been blessed with the gift of gab. But if you are going to represent uh, a state, a great state like Georgia, then that means that you've got to have some substance uh, behind the policies that you are, are fighting for. And those policies have to be actually be linked to what everyday folks are asking for. Um, and I know that, um, you know, Senator Warnock is going to do an excellent job uh, and making sure that folks know exactly where he stands, what the policies are, uh, and how he will help to leverage additional sets of opportunities for Georgia. You know, and this is the point that, that Teresa, that, that, that we keep talking. I mean, people can sit here uh, and they can yell, holler, scream, and uh, say what should happen, what needs to happen, all this sort of stuff. Look, this is the bottom line. If you don't, if you don't vote, if, if, you, if you don't realize the role that that plays, not just when it comes to policy, but what we were talking about when it comes to those federal judges, then you don't understand politics. The reality is this here. You're going to have critical races that Democrats are trying to hold their seats in Georgia, Nevada, okay? But as I have been saying, you hold the line there, and you're able to win Wisconsin, we're able to end, win Pennsylvania, uh, able to win potentially uh, Ohio. Florida's going to be real tough. You got North Carolina. Hey, you pick up North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, Pennsylvania, now all of a sudden, it's 53-47. It changes the dynamics uh, there. And so people, you know, we, we talk about you have to connect the dots. You have to connect the dots. Primaries are coming up very soon in Texas. We're voting in March. Not sure when the primaries are there in Pennsylvania. Uh, you have, of course, several people who are running for uh, the U.S. Senate seat uh, there, Democratic and Republican side as well. These are going to be critical elections that are going to determine will you have the votes to break the filibuster to pass the George Floyd Justice Act. And so I know people say, man, we did our part in 2020. Yeah, but guess what? You, you got to do your part in 2020, 2021, 2022, school board races, county races, city races. Hey, th this ain't just, hey, I did it one time, I'm out. Yeah, the essence of politics is about engagement um, from the local level to the state level to the federal level. So when we are talking about the primaries right now, you know, in Pennsylvania, we're also dealing with redistricting. So people are not sure what district they're actually running for and if they'll be running in the same district if they are incumbents. So if we look at some of the primary elections here. Accordingly, it's supposed to be May 17th, but it actually could be pushed back to June. So that decision still hasn't been finalized or made. So you have everyone trying to make their own individual plans about what next and what could potentially happen. But you're absolutely right. If we continuously talk about the education of some of these local elections and the importance of these state elections, it absolutely can change, you know, how a state like Pennsylvania and some other, you know, red and um, states that actually has some blue components um, that it can really just change the, the slate and it change some of the activities. So 
think part of it is again just making people aware and at and and making sure you know whatever party you know obviously the Democratic Party needs to make sure that every election um, that there is a budget for uh, educational purposes so people know when to vote. Why am I getting these emails about, you know, individuals um, either from the federal level or from the state level or local level um, are asking us for donations? That's because there is some election coming up and they need to be involved. Uh, Demario. Yeah, I agree with Mustafa and Teresa. And when she's talking about a budget, I want to see the Democrats put money into the hands of people like Teresa to build power within the political system, building businesses, advertise with people I think, like... I think Teresa agrees with you on that one. I think, she, I think she agrees with you. I think Teresa agrees with you on that one. Absolutely. And they need to advertise. And I appreciate the ad by Senator Warnock. I'm a big fan of his. And I hope that he spends money with black media. But, Roland, if you just give me an opportunity, I'm still so touched by that family that we just talked to with the brother from Jamaica. As you know, I, I, I handle these type of cases all over the nation. And to know that they're not getting any cooperation from anyone there in, uh, in Pennsylvania it really breaks my heart. I would hope that they're listening, that they will find a lawyer that can open up or file a wrongful death lawsuit and they can conduct their own discovery to try to get some answers. No one is shot nine times by accident. No one is left out in, the, out in the front yard to die by accident. This was some type of a nefarious scenario. And if the government, the Jamaican, U.S., Allegheny County, whatever government will not help them, they need to find a lawyer in that locale that will file the lawsuit at least utilize the civil process to get some form of accountability. I'm devastated to see that mother sit there and say for two months she doesn't know what's going on. And that actually goes back to what we're talking about here voting, because that district attorney is elected. And so that district attorney, does not he's not protecting or not serving all of the people in that particular locale. So that's another reason we have to be engaged in everything. But I hope if they're listening, I hope you can get you an attorney to file your wrongful death lawsuit and try to get some answers for your son. All right, then. All right, folks. Uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, uh, of course, of Ohio, she's the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, sent out this tweet earlier today. She was not happy at all when Kentucky Congressman Hal Rogers poked her and said to her, kiss my ass, when she asked him to put on a face mask. This is the tweet that she posted. Uh, today, while heading to the House floor for votes, I respectfully asked my colleague, Representative Hal Rogers, to put on a mask while boarding the train. He then poked uh, my back, demanding I get on the train. When I asked him not to touch me, he responded, kiss my ass. Uh, this is the kind of disrespect we have been fighting for years and indicative of the larger issue we have with GOP members flaunting health and safety mandates designed to keep us and our staff safe. Representative Hal Rogers, when you are ready to grow up and apologize for your behavior, she, she wrote uh, in the tweet, you know where to find me. Well, it didn't take Sister Long uh, to get her apology. Uh, I was just about an hour ago, uh, I was just on, um, I was just checking to see what the latest was, and uh, Hal Rogers uh, tweeted this uh, about 6.30. Let me pull this thing up. Um, here we go. Give me one second. Um, here we go. Uh, he tweeted, This afternoon, I met with Representative Beatty to personally apologize. My words were not acceptable, and I expressed my regret to her First and foremost. Well, you should, you arrogant son of a bitch. Uh, this is the kind of crap that we see uh, in Congress right now with many of these Republicans. Uh, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Bo Boebert, they don't give a damn about uh, wearing masks. But uh, you don't put your hands on a black woman, uh, Hal Rogers. Teresa, she should have checked him. Absolutely. I mean, look... The comfortability here, you know, is just a bit alarming. You know, it's it's the traditional privilege. It's the outlandish remarks. Um, I'm, I'm glad she did it, but I know she wanted to do more. So I am absolutely happy um, that she, she kept her composure. But part of it is, you know, it, it did have to be, the, the alarm had to be sounded on this guy. Um, because part of it is, you know, if one feels comfortable, then everyone else starts to follow suit. So... Good for Red Betty. You know, you you know, you you poke me. That's that's asking me to smack the hell out of you, Demario. 
Man, I am I'm enraged by that. As you know, I spent a lot of time this last year with Congresswoman Beatty and uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus. I cannot believe that. You know, I, I wish that um, she would have filed a police report because that is battery when you touch someone else. That is a crime. And then when he said, kiss my ass, that is actually, I would say, assault. He was putting her in imminent uh, danger of, of being touched or harmed even further. You know, these white supremacists like that, they cannot feel comfortable, as Teresa just stated. They need police reports. If this happens to you out in the real world, people that are listening, file your police report and file a civil lawsuit against these folks. Let them know that they have no right to touch us and treat us as property. How dare him do that to not only a black woman, but the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, one of our leaders in this country. It enrages me to hear that. I did not know anything about that. And I certainly will be reaching out to Congress woman Beatty and expressing my support for her and anything that I can do personally to help her with this situation. This is well, ridiculous. Well, of course, you, you can't know everything. That's why we got Rose Martin Unfiltered. See, that's the whole point of the show. Uh, Mustafa, what you did. You do with a great it, job, my friend. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. What you're dealing with, Mustafa, what you deal, you're dealing with some arrogant Republicans who are emboldened by Donald Trump, who want to flout masks, they want to flout mandates, they don't care. And you know what? They got to be chin checked. Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, uh, to Representative Rogers, you know, at one time, you know, you had a, a person in your life by the name of Cynthia and, and Shirley, your former and current wife, and then you also have a daughter named Allison. So if someone did that to Allison, how would you feel? What kind of repercussions do you think that that individual would have needed to receive if they'd done something like that? So we understand the dynamics that are going on. They don't see us quite as full humans. They don't see us and they don't respect us, no matter what our titles are, no matter how many letters we have after our name. These folks continue to see us the same way that their grandparents and their great-grandparents did. The difference is we are no longer silent and we will no longer allow you to punk us. Um, so we will utilize every tool that's in our arsenal to check you. And these white supremacists, white nationalists, they don't like getting checked. So today, uh, the U.S. Senate, there was a hearing uh, for one of President Biden's nominees, uh, who's an expert on anti-Semitism. Oh, Lord, crybaby ass Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who has been saying some of the most foul stuff, sucking up to Donald Trump over the last five years. He took offense to a tweet where she called something he said white supremacy, white nationalism. Watch this exchange today uh, in the U.S. Senate and listen to this crybaby. You call me names. Let me ask you a question. Somebody came up to you privately, quietly, and said, uh, you're a racist. You're a white supremacist. You're a white nationalist. By the way, I, I do not believe you are. I would, I would never assume that because, you know, certainly growing up when I was being taught uh, the commandment that says, do not bear false witness, my Lutheran catechism says, uh, always put the best construction on things. In other words, always assume the best about people, not the worst. So you know, how would you feel if somebody just privately called you racist? First of all, I would say they're wrong. Second of all, I would uh, disagree with them. And uh, as I said earlier, but I want to reiterate that even in my critiques of people, um, I'm very careful um, never to ascribe to the person. Well, I thought, you know, I, I heard that. I thought that was interesting. You say you never criticize the person. Um, but that's not true. What, you're just, what, you, what you just testified there is false. Because not only did you go on... Not only you, first of all, you don't know me. You don't know a lot of the people that you have accused online in front of millions of people. You, 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 have, you have engaged in the malicious poison. You've accused people you don't know of very vile things. I mean, wouldn't you agree that probably calling somebody a racist is just shy, just under murderer and rapist? Calling somebody a racist? It's about a, a serious and vile accusations you can hurl over some, against somebody, somebody you don't even know. I mean, you've never talked to me. You've never met me. You don't know what's in my heart, do you? No, I have no idea. What, no, I do not know what's in your heart at all. I know. What so, so why, why would you go on social media and, uh, and, 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 and make those charges? And not only me. And by the way, what Senator Rubio said, this, this position is supposed to be for a nonpartisan. 
it seems like the, how you engage in malicious poison is purely partisan. You're, you're hurling these charges against people that are generally one political persuasion. That's not nonpartisan. But again, why did you why did you go on social media and level these vile and horrible charges against people, including me, that you don't even know? You didn't know anything about the Joseph Project. You didn't know about my what's in my heart. Why did you do it? Well, first of all, I don't think, I, as far as I can tell, and I'm, I'm happy to, to have this conversation further or right here, uh, call you personally, or I don't call people personally. No, it's, I mean, you, we, all, we all know the tweet. It's right here. Right, right. Okay? No. You said it's pure and simple. Pure and simple. It's White supremacy, nat nationalism. And then you, you refer to your know, articles. Right. They, they continue the charge. Uh, do, do, do you do you feel bad about that at all? I mean, I, I, do you, you retract that? I mean, do you? What, yeah. what, I mean, what's your current position on this? Can we um, allow the witness to answer your questions? Um, I, as I said earlier, um, it was not nuanced. Uh, I would not do diplomacy by tweet. Um, while I may disagree with your what you said specifically, and I think that's a legitimate uh, difference. Um, I certainly did not mean it, and I'm sorry if it was taken, and I'm sorry if I made it in a way uh, that it could be assumed to be a, uh, a political uh, well, act, act of person personally. Well, listen, I appreciate your, your apology, and I'll accept your apology. It's, it's, it's more than, for example, what the chairman of this committee has done, and other members who've also you know, callously and cavalierly hurled the same charges that I would consider our malicious poison to our our body politic today but again appreciate appreciate the apology but i think somebody that has had a 30-year professional career ought to know better and when you're being nominated and considered for confirmation to a position of diplomacy representing the united states i can't i certainly cannot support your nomination i hope my other colleagues won't either you're just simply not qualified for it but i, I wish you the best in life and i do accept your apology let me ask you know what? I, we had to deal with four years. No, 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 no. Let me take that back. We had to deal with nine years of a racist asshole in Donald Trump, Mustafa. We had to deal with this man attacking black women, trashing people, on Twitter until they ban his punk ass. And you got all these old weak ass Republicans, oh my goodness, you said mean stuff about me on Twitter. That's how they shot down Neera Tandon's appointment to head to OMB. They, ha they have been complaining and whining, and I don't know, wh why do you keep targeting uh, is partisan Republicans in your tweets? Because probably most of y'all are saying some racist shit. That's probably why. So you mad because she called it out. Why don't you just check the, the BS that you do? I'm so sick of these whiny ass Republicans whining about a damn tweet. When they didn't, when, when, whenever, when Trump says something, this, this, this is always their response walking down Capitol Hill. And this is how they would go down the hall. They'd be asking him a question. Uh, sorry, I didn't read the tweet. I can't comment on it. I can't comment. That was a whole deal. Now they got all the time in the world to read tweets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they use denial as, as justification for their lack of action. Uh, and, and supporting uh, of all kinds of racist actions. If people want to, uh, for folks to stop calling them racist, stop supporting racist uh, behavior. Stop supporting racist pieces of action. Stop supporting, you know, all these other types of racism that plays out that anyone with any inkling of intelligence knows is going on and that you are playing a role in propping up. You know, when, when President Trump was in, like you said, they used to just ignore the majority of the things that he said and that he did that they knew had significant impacts inside of black and brown communities, and they remained silent in many instances. And then, now it's gotten good to them. So they'll say something, and then they'll come, turn around and say, that's not what I said. And you'll play the tape, or you'll read the transcript back, and they'll still be like, well, that's taken out of context. So, you know, they assume that people are, are much less intelligent than they actually are, and they also assume that they can get away with saying and doing whatever they, they want to do without there being any repercussions. I, I, 
I understand the sister and the situation that she was just in, because I wish she could have probably said how she truly felt. But understand when you're going through a confirmation uh, set of activities that, you know, there's a certain level of decorum that you got to present. You know what, uh, Teresa, when I remember I was in Atlanta. Uh, we were talking to uh, a judge there, and she had a staffer who was a millennial. And she's like, Judge, why you always criticize millennials? She said, because y'all do millennial shit. That's what she said. I would say to the Republican Party, why y'all keep getting called racist white supremacists? Because y'all do white supremacist shit. That's what y'all do. Tom Cotton, Ron Johnson, Ted Cruz. We can go on and on and on. You mad because folks calling you out? Because that's the stuff that you do. Yeah, the saying is, if the shoe fits, wear it. I think, you know, just part of my issue here, you know, when we're going through a confirmation hearing, you know, on taxpayer dollars, they're going, they're talking about their grievances with a tweet. Um, some of them don't even handle their own Twitter accounts, but yet on taxpayers' dollars, they want to take the time for their reasoning of why someone's not confirmed for a specific position is because they wanted to um, basically get the point across that they're not racist, which apparently in the GOP nowadays, if you're being called a racist, we see their approval rating go up and their fundraising goals skyrocket. So it's always interesting that if it's like they don't want to be called it, but they actually do because they try to prove a point. And then when they think the point is proven, you start to see the fundraising go up. So very interesting. I, I just, DeMario, these cats crap. You, you, you take that, that, that punk ass you got in Oklahoma, Langford. All the little comp, the crap that he said about uh, Tulsa, and that's why he got booted from the damn commission. I'm like, man, we ain't sitting here playing games with y'all. We gonna call it like we see it. And you know what, Ron Johnson? Every white supremacist, white nationalist thing that you said is gonna be in ads when we defeat your sorry ass in the election in November. Yeah, I co-sign everything you say right there, Roland. And but I tell you, this is a great example when I say the the Democrats be too weak. I'm I'm embarrassed for the nominee who capitulated uh, her rightful statements about Ron Johnson being the white supremacist and white nationalist that he is. She capitulated, apologized to him, and then he still said, but I'm not going to support you. You're not qualified. This is a great example. Of why are we trying to appease the other side when they are not... DeMario. They are completely not ever going to do anything to help us out. But she could at least stand to say it. Go ahead, Roland, go she, ahead. She didn't need to do all that. You know why? Because two Republicans already said they're going to vote for her. So that's one of those deals where when you're in a confirmation hearing, all right, boo, your little feelings hurt. I'm sorry you took it that way. Y'all go ahead and confirm me. I ain't taking a tweet down. That's what the deal is. I mean, that's... But I, that, but I think that sends the wrong the, message. DeMario, here's the deal. Me and you ain't gonna never get uh, nominated for anything that requires <laughs> Senate right. confirmation. It's but right. I'm just saying, that's the, that's the thing. That's what Republicans and Democrats do when you go on before no, Senate. No, no, look at Brett Kavanaugh. No, 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 Brett Kavanaugh. no, 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 no. Remember, Brett Kavanaugh did one, then, then one thing and he flipped to the other. I'm talking, that's Supreme Court. I'm talking about there are other examples of folks who've been nominated for lower level. This, this is a lower level position. This, this ain't no major position. I'm just saying, she didn't sit here and go at him because, like, you know what? I already got the votes. I'm going to be confirmed. I'm not about to sit here and get back into the little tit-tat for this fool. That's all it is. I mean, I'm well, with I you, but that's, but that's well, the I deal. Think, I think it's very important that, that we speak truth to power at all times. I think it's important that when other people are sitting down, we stand up and talk. When other people are retreating, we fight, and we tell the truth. She could have simply stated, which I would have liked for her to say, listen, I made that, that analysis based upon what you said. That was something that I felt was right, racist and white supremacist, and it put people's lives in danger, particularly black and brown people. I'm sorry you felt that way. Or anything like that, but she completely capitulated and backed up and said, I'm sorry if I, you know, I didn't mean that. And I don't think we need to do this with these racist white supremacists. We that ain't going to get her, but I'm, oh, but I'm telling you, that ain't going to get her confirmed. That's going to guarantee, she, that's going to guarantee she, she, she don't get confirmed. He wasn't going to vote for her anyway. No, so no, 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 because, again, because it's not about him. I just told you, 
Two other Republican senators had already said they voted for her. Republican. She just need all Democrats. They have the votes. Now, this is one place. No, no, no. They... No, no, no. You don't know that. See? You assuming. Votes. You assuming Manchin and Cinema going to vote for her. I'm trying to tell you. That's what I'm... Hey, I'm trying to tell you... Demario, there's a difference between that, that, that and, and that's why there's stuff that happens in D.C. that's political, and so when they say, I ain't gonna sit here and go hard here, fine. Okay, you look hurt feelings. I don't, I'm moving I said on. she had to go hard rolling. Why does she have to apologize to this punk? No, 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 no. Like, actually, if you actually heard it, she didn't apologize. What she said is, yeah. no, no, she, she said, said I'm sorry. no, she said, I'm sorry you took it that way. But she didn't sit here and say, uh, no, Senator, I'm sorry. I did not call you that. No, she didn't. But that's the, di that's the confirmation game. It's one of those things where do you win, do you win, do you want to win the skirmish? Do you want to win the battle? Or do you want to win the war? Every Sorry, fight, the war. every fight ain't a war. Some stuff is a skirmish. I mean I understand that, but we shouldn't be apologizing to white supremacists point blank, period. It, no, it, here's it, it the deal. That. Here's the deal. You don't waste that much time on him because your whole focus is to take him out in November. And then guess what? It don't matter. <laughs> See, that's my deal. My deal is he up for re-election. The thing is, take him out. That's the, that's the that best 100%. revenge. That's the best revenge. All right, I got to go to a break. I got to go to a break, uh, y'all. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, of course, uh, we had an artist who's coming up, but also she a hooper. Why is she out here embarrassing people all on social media? Y'all might have seen some of these videos. Uh, we're going to talk to uh, her next right here, Roland Martin Unfiltered, right here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Table with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. My name is Charlie Wilson. Hi, I'm Sally Richardson Whitfield. And I'm Dodger Whitfield. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. Good night. y'all uh, uh golfer golfer mark lie golfer mark lie uh commentator for sears xm radio y'all he he got fired because they were talking about you know women women golfers and somehow he said to talk about the WNBA. just listen to what this fool said you're not getting
So he made these comments, y'all, uh, while they were talking about, while they were talking about, um, let me see if I can find another video of it. They were talking about, again, uh, these various, uh, and he said, look, man, if you had to make me watch uh, the WNBA, Lord, I would shoot myself uh, in the head. Well, that did not go over well with the folks at Sirius XM Radio. So um, Mark ended up getting fired uh, for that. Uh, and uh, a lot of people have, have, have talked about it. He, and so, of course, you know, like the rest of these people, oh, my God, this is cancel culture. Uh, he put this tweet out. Uh, he said, the fact that I, let's see here, let me pose you. The fact that I can't relate to WNBA does not make me sexist in any way. All you haters should listen to the whole segment where I completely glorify women's golf, which I love to cover. Thanks for listening. All right, so, so, but here's the deal, though. So you got guys out there who say women can't hoop. Well, what happens when dudes in the gym talk trash and think they better than a sister and then she start roasting their ass? Yo, watch some of these videos. Watch this. Teams. This is what I did. Bunch of these videos, y'all. They are hilarious. Y'all got, got one more? Okay. Okay, play one more. He called me old. So I showed him old school. So a Angela Johnson uh, joins us right now. She's an artist in Chicago. And so while she's schooling folks on a hard court, she's also schooling folks when it comes to art. Why, why, why are you sitting here just abusing people like that? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm just trying to represent for the women. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, but but but, but you ain't got to sit here and set the camera up, you know, and 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 just recording, you know. So 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 how did that whole thing start? Where you like, okay, let me go ahead and sit this down so everybody can see what happens. It was crazy. It was random. Just one day, we set the camera up, and we just wanted to record my interactions with the guys because we couldn't believe that they were treating me like this. And it just started from there. The thing, so uh, I don't know if we have the one video. So I guess uh, uh, you and some dude wasn't playing any defense whatsoever. And then he then he says something like, "Yo, uh, if I if I just have to d you up, you're not gonna score one point." And then then all of a sudden you just got all pissed. You just you start you start rubbing the sand off your shoes and everything. <laughs> start stretching. Really, really. Well, look, I got a little old school in me. Um, I guess I'm not part of the millennials, but, um, look, if you talk, we gonna play. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, so that you hoop in school or do you just, you just hoop on your own? 
Yeah, so I hooped all through high school, uh, four years of varsity, and then I went to college off and on for about four years. I just got back from Canada a couple years ago. Gotcha. And so, so you're regularly in the gym, uh, just sitting here, uh, whooping ass, taking names, huh? Well, no. I was actually coming back from break. These videos are me out of shape. Um, so I was shocked to get the responses that they're getting. Hold up, oh, hold up. These, oh, oh, see, now you're trying to brag. Yeah, these, no, these no. videos, you know, I wasn't in shape and everything, you no, know. No. No, it just you can see my stomach kind of like out. I, I don't want people to think that this is how I played through college because it wasn't. Well, see, well, see, well, you see, oh, see, I see now you're like, damn, these videos getting attention. I, I better go right? ahead and get myself back in shape. I, I, I don't need them to see talk about me that way. So, is, is that, that, that what you say, huh? Absolutely. We're looking forward to getting more competition as the videos get bigger. Um, so, I need to definitely get in some shape. All right, but so people are watching your videos, but how are you promoting your art? The videos have been doing so well that the art kind of took a back seat, unfortunately, but I'm still painting. All right, so what kind of painting are you doing? I do a lot of kind of like abstract art. Um, I try to get art that brings a vibe to a room that's unique. Oh, and you—that's the basketballs. Um, so yeah. So the, all these, so all of these pieces that you actually painted on basketballs. Well, they're either painted on canvases or on basketballs. Okay, okay, all right, all right, got it. Now, how long have you been doing? You've been doing art. I've been doing art for a while. I just got back into it after college, but um, it's definitely therapy for me. So it's something I appreciate. I love art. Okay. All right, then. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I know DeMario, he can't hoop. So I'm just going to go ahead. And, I'm going to go ahead. And, you, know, he can look, you can look at DeMario and know he can't hoop. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and start with him. DeMario, go ahead. Well, I'm glad you know, because you know I got to get out of here, man. I'm impressed by the young lady. I, I hoop like a football player that I am. Like so I said, I you, like I said, you can't I'm hoop. I would have been out there fouling you. I would have been out there pushing you down because you was just schooling those fools. And the little dude go first, he's talking about you too old. Then he go say, oh, you a grown woman out here. And right. I'm on the AC. <laughs> was yeah. amazing. So, hey, I, where, did you, where, did you, where are you from? I'm from Chicago, Illinois, South Side. Okay, cool. Well, that's good. I, I I play with sisters just like you that grew up playing with the guys who had no fear and learned how to talk that noise. You only learn that when you're on the on the court with the best players, period. Men or, or females. And I can tell you got that game. So, hey, roll this right. If I'm playing you, I'm going to have to give you the elbow. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I ain't gonna sir. I'm going to have to give you the elbow. I'm old school, too. I'm going to have to give you the elbow. I understand. <laughs> You could call a personal injury lawyer like me to sue me, but I'm going to give you the elbow. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> All That's right. The thing. Mustafa. Well, sister, thank you for opening up that can of whoop ass on, on folks who sometimes <laughs> need to know what time it is. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that we've made some strides in relationship to sports and people understanding uh, how amazing female athletes are. Um, and dealing with the misogyny that still exists that we saw, you know, how how's your journey been? How what tools do you use besides breaking them down on the court uh, to make sure that people understand this is a new day? Well, it was very shocking to be honest to see that we still go through that to this day because you know I was I wasn't in regular gym, so I didn't see how the guys felt about women basketball until I got in there and then they don't pass you the ball, they don't pick you up, they don't even guard you. So I was like, well, this is an opportunity to bring some awareness um, to, our, to women's basketball and women's sports, period. Teresa. Yeah, well, I am, uh, I, I love it, one. So thank you for representing the women. Um, I was literally sitting here looking at your website, and I can't get over the cartel name of it. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I do think names are a very important part of businesses and how we start to evolve them. So tell me a little bit about uh, your website and um, you know some of the individuals that you decided to capture in some of your paintings. OK, so the name of my website is AW Universe. Thanks for asking. It's basically a universe where I've created a lot of what I do, which is basketball, art, music, and comedy. Um, it, it's a lot, so I made a universe of it. And a lot of my art, it, it started within the pro-black 
and then it just evolved into a lot of like joyful but happy scenes and just want to bring some type of joy in a room with the canvases um so yeah all right so what is uh take us to uh your website uh, in terms of uh, if folks want to check it out, uh, what's the name of it, and uh, and uh, can they get your stuff there? So the name of the website is awuniverse.bigcartel.com. Um, you all can order shirts on there, canvases, prints, um, original artwork. I would love the support, and we're also coming out with shirts um, for the women for the basketball movement that we got going on today. Or Angela. Anjanae, that's Ange my name. Anjanae, Anjanae. All right, then. So I, they had Angela in the script. So Anjanae. So all right, then. Well, look, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, good luck. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking for your in-shape basketball videos uh, since you said we showed all the out-of-shape videos. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. I really appreciate the love. And I, and I don't know if you're actually from Chicago, because normally when you meet somebody, when somebody's actually from Chicago, they give you the full address of where they grew up. You just said Chicago South Side. See, so that what that tells me is you probably grew up in the South Suburbs as opposed to the South Sea, right there. See, I told y'all, <laughs> which means your ass ain't from Chicago. So why don't you tell people the actual city you grew up in, because your ass is not from Chicago. Well, look, I'm trying to stay incognito nope. out here. No, 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 no. Let me, I see, I need everybody watching. I lived in Chicago six years. I keep telling y'all this. If when you meet somebody black who's actually from Chicago, they gonna give you the street and the cross street. Yeah, they, they gonna are. say 87th and Cottage Grove. They, that's what they gonna say. If you meet anybody black who say, hey, I'm from Chicago, and they leave it at that, they ask from, uh, they ask from a suburb, they are not from Chicago. See, that's, that's why when you said it, I was waiting, I went, she ain't from no damn Chicago. <laughs> I'm like, she grew up in the South Suburbs. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, South Suburbs. I know yeah. I have family in the, in the city, but I ain't gonna claim. Yep, yeah, there you go. Bust it. All right, then. See, that's right. Uh, I, I just rejected that, because I'm like, yeah. I, I saw that, I'm like, oh, she ain't from Chicago. I they, owe you one for that. Uh-huh, they give you the full address. All right, we we'll appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. All right, take care. I'm doing it. See, y'all, see, uh, that's how you always bust somebody when they say that. I'm telling you. I don't know how they do it in Philadelphia, uh, Teresa, but I'm telling you. Anybody black from Chicago, they give you damn near their whole address. They give you the street and the cross street where they from. Always. That's how it works. I probably say the same thing is happening here. If you're like, oh, I'm from Philly. Okay, so where? Oh, uh, you know, if if it's not from the suburban county, it's either northwest, southwest. You from so you got to be very specific. Otherwise, they'll be like, oh yeah, Montgomery County or Ardmore. Like, okay, so that's the suburban. That's not Philadelphia, but we got it. Hey, hey, Mustafa, <laughs> just like when, when I asked what somebody said they're from Houston, you go, no, are you from Houston, or are you from a suburb of Houston? Because see, I have a very simple philosophy. If you got, if you are from a place where y'all elect your own mayor and city council, your ass cannot claim the large city. No. So they do the same thing. Oh yeah, I'm Chicago. No, no, you can't. No, you from that liberty ass town. You from Harvey. You from Olympia Fields. You are not from Chicago. I bust them all the time. Same thing from Houston. Like yeah, I'm from Houston. Well, no, where you grew up? Spring. Yo ass from Spring, it's, it's called Spring, Texas. You are not from Houston. Oh, Katie, that is not Houston. So I bust them all the time. <laughs> well, you know, when, when I tell folks, you know, my time living in Detroit, I'm from Freeland Street, so I want to be exact. See, see, from. see, you give yeah, me the street. 
But from when the part when I grew up in Appalachia, I just tell everybody we from that big oak tree over there on the left hand side. So it's totally different from the rural and the urban. Oh Lord, see now, now see now you're talking about the country. So that's a whole different that's a whole different thing right there. All right, that is it for us. Uh, hey, folks, uh, let me shout out to people folks at Grambling. I, sp I missed yesterday's show because I spoke at Grambling. Yeah, you know they gave me some swag. Uh, President Rick, Rick Gallo, he, he a Kappa, but it's all good. It's all good, you know, because, again, without Alpha, they known as Kappa Psi. So, uh, well, I, so I had a good time down there with Grambling. I appreciate the swag they gave me, so that's why I'm rocking, this, rocking uh, the sweater. This is perfect because it was cold as hell here in D.C., uh, it, was, it was gorgeous today in the daytime, 50 degrees. When that sun dropped, that temp dropped. So uh, I'm real warm uh, in uh, the zip up right here that Grandma hooked me up. Don't forget, y'all, uh, we have a partnership with McDonald's and Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the only real fraternity. Mustafa is a member. I'm a member. Uh, Demario, he belonged to the other, other, one of them other youth groups. Uh, and so uh, this is in celebration of the 115th anniversary of Alpha and our seven founders. Uh, we're partnering with McDonald's, giving away seven. $15,000 scholarships for juniors and seniors. For juniors and seniors. Uh, that's what we're giving away. So we're sitting here, $15,000, $15,000. Go to tmcf.org. Brittany, put your phone down in the control room. Pay attention to the damn show. Okay, put your phone down. Uh, let, me, let me go ahead, let me go, let me come back to the scholarship. See, I told y'all, pay attention in the control room, okay? Pay attention to the show. Put the phone down. You over there text messaging and on social media. The only thing, no, you are not on group me. You're lying. I can see it's a big glass window. I can see. See, y'all, y'all need to see if, if Henry turned one of them cameras around. So y'all gotta understand. You got, you got these, see, she doing millennial shit right now. That's what she doing, millennial shit. Where, they, where you trying to sit here and do the show. And my niece laughing because she do millennial shit. Where you sitting here trying to work and they be on a damn phone the whole time you trying to work. That's why, that's why like, when a controller will be messing up, because they on their on they phone, they missing stuff, okay? So when they ain't playing something right, because they on their damn phone, okay? So luckily now we got this big old glass window right here where I can literally see inside the control room. I can see everybody while I'm on this side of the studio. And see, guess what? Their back's to me, so they can't lie when they got their phone. Her problem is, again, when you a millennial, she holding her shit up, leaning all back in the chair. I can literally see her whole damn conversation. If she was smart like us, Mustafa, those of us who were in Gen X, we knew how to cheat with it in our lap. We knew, because see, if you see it right here, it's contained right here. Nobody in the back can see you or nothing. But see, she don't know that. But that's what happened. So, mm-hmm, your ass got busted. So, yeah, put the damn phone down. Thank you. Uh-huh. Let me get back to talking about this scholarship. Go to tmcf.org to apply. All the rules are on the <laughs> website. Y'all can check it out uh, and apply for the scholarship. The deadline is February 28th. February 28th, and that's how we do it. That's right. This is the blackest show on TV, on digital, because we keep it real all of the time. So that's it for me and my millennial shit staffers. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the panel, Mustafa, uh, Teresa, as well as Demario for being with us, folks. I uh, had a good time today. Uh, we're going to see you guys tomorrow. Yo, Kara, don't I have the, uh, the uh, mayor of Inglewood tomorrow? All right, so Inglewood, that's where the, the Rams are hosting the Super Bowl is located in Inglewood, California. Y'all know that's a black city, right? Well, I'm going to have the mayor of Inglewood on the show tomorrow uh, talking about that. All right, y'all, that's it for me. Uh, I got to go. Uh, I'll see y'all later. I had an early flight, 6 a.m. leaving Shreveport. So, bro, I need a nap. So, I will see y'all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network owned by a Gen X who knows how not to get busted when you are at work. Brittany, holla!